we've talked about treatments and we've talked about when to initiate those treatments. Steve, what's the biological basis for some of these new uh, therapies that we have? So there are several pathways that have been identified that are very relevant to the pathogenesis and potential targets. We've talked a lot about RET as the uh, causative agent in virtually all inherited, but most of the patients with advanced disease, in fact, have sporadic medullary cancer. And in about 40 to 50 percent of them, they have somatic RET mutations. And RET signals uh, upstream in the MAP kinase and PI3 kinase pathways. So in theory, there's, there's good reason to think, and there are preclinical data that targeting RET specifically can have uh, tumor control benefit. Um, however, in clinical practice, we don't have pure RET inhibitors. And all of the drugs that we have been working with that inhibit RET also are anti-VEGFR uh, agents. And it turns out that VEGF and VEGFR are um, very important uh, gene products in medullary cancer. Uh, and we have great evidence that this is critical to the uh, angiogenesis for the disease. So the agents we have that target RET and VEGFR uh, have a, an effect on the tumor and probably on the, on the microenvironment as well. There are other signaling cascades that are important. RAS mutations have been identified increasingly in patients whose tumors do not have RET mutations, and obviously that hits the same pathways. And VEGFR also can signal through RAS, so we're seeing overlaps. Finally, there is some evidence of the roles for the EGF receptor in RET mutant tumors and of other pathways like CMET signaling and FGF receptors. So we have multiple uh, kinase pathways that other than RET are commonly found and implicated in many other solid tumors as well that are potential targets. We talked about the role for mutational testing in the diagnosis, especially of the hereditary syndromes. Is there a role for RET mutational testing uh, of somatic uh, disease? It's not yet standard of care. Uh, what the information tells us is that finding a RET918 mutation in the sporadic tumor uh, is prognostic for worse outcome, as, as Laurie mentioned earlier. Uh, there's also some evidence now from the clinical trials that the patients whose tumors had those 918 mutations may be more sensitive and could benefit more from these interventions. So it could be a worse prognosis, but more likely to benefit from treatment. Nonetheless, in all of these studies, the patients with no demonstrable mutations at all still have various levels of benefit from treatment. So it's not yet at a point where we can say you should be treated with X or Y because of your mutation status. That's the, the dichotomous uh, role of that M918T mutation is really interesting. It can be prognostic. It may also be predictive. Right. And it may be predictive of the efficacy of these novel therapies. Eric, we know of one drug that's been approved, Vandetinib. Can you share with us some of the data around that and, and its use in medullary thyroid cancer? So Vandetinib was one of the earlier drugs to be evaluated and initially being evaluated in just hereditary medullary thyroid cancer. But it went, when it went to the phase three study, it was, it was evaluated in all metro thyroid cancer, whether it was hereditary or not hereditary. Um, it's because patients live for a very long time, um, because also they allow for a crossover, the primary outcome was progression-free survival. But it did show a quite a bit of a significant improvement in progression-free survival. And response rates in the phase three study was, were excellent at 44%. So it definitely is a very active uh, agent in the disease. We don't know how it changes long-term outcome, but we do know that it can keep the disease um, held back uh, for, for quite a while. And you know, the thing you just have to do is be able to manage the toxicities that's associated with it. We're gonna talk uh, uh, certainly uh, more about the toxicities of uh, this drug and of course the other drug that's been approved in medullary thyroid cancer, cabozantinib. Lori, can you comment uh, about the clinical data around that? Uh, sure. So there has been a randomized placebo-controlled trial with cabozantinib um, in which patients with medullary thyroid disease uh, were randomized to ca cabozantinib versus placebo. Unlike the uh, Vandetinib study, uh, one of the entry criteria for the Cabozatinib study was that patients had to have progressive disease at study entry. So patients had to have had 
uh, de demonstrable progression over a 14 over a 14 month period of time prior to study entry before starting therapy on the trial and so it was a different patient population than the vandetinib study that's important I think for us to to know when we're comparing uh, the data from the two trials and thinking which drug do we use there are very different patient populations in the two different studies so it's really I think impossible to compare the results from one study to the other study um, but like the um, vandetinib study the the primary endpoint for the cabozantinib study was progression-free survival um, there was no crossover allowed in the cabozantinib study as is different than the vandetinib study. Um, however, again, because the overall survival for this patient population, even when they have bad disease, is still measured in years, um, I, we think that uh, achieving an overall survival benefit, particularly when there are going to be other clinical trial options for patients and other treatment options for patients, um, is going to be a difficult primary endpoint to meet. Um, so, so we do have uh, progression-free survival as a primary endpoint for the cabozantinib study. Study. And there was a very significant uh, 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 progression-free survival benefit with cabozantinib as compared to placebo in the clinical trial. So there was a seven-month improvement in progression-free survival from four months to 11 uh, plus months uh, with the treatment of the drug. Mike, you said earlier that often the conclusion from the multidisciplinary tumor board is to exercise caution, is, is not to treat. Right. So when do we make the decision and who do we treat? Yeah, I think the easier way to think about this is who do we not treat? Um, because there's a, we can pretty much agree on a bunch of those patients. Obviously, if you're cured, if you have elevated calcitonin as a CEA in the absence of structural disease, uh, we're not going to treat that with a medicine. Probably if you have small volume disease, um, certainly small volume disease that can be surgically correctable, or maybe even small volume distant metastasis that we think, as Laurie said, this is going to progress over many, many years. We wouldn't treat that. So in the simplest thing, I'm looking for fairly large volume disease that's structurally progressive that I can't treat any other way. If it's a single bone med and I can treat you with surgery, external beam radiation, I'll do that before going to systemic therapy. So in the simplest aspect, structural disease, clinically progressive. The other thing, big structural disease with symptoms that we talked about. That might drive me to treat a little bit more. So I think the real key is to look at the vast majority of medullary patients, as Lori said, that have persistent low-level disease that we're not talking about treating yet, and really reserving it for folks that have structural disease that probably is progressive or significantly symptomatic. Did I miss the last